Good evening all, and welcome. Tonight we have a collection of four twisted creepypastas, written by the incredible Tobias Wade, which are sure to make your skin crawl. But without further ado, it's time to get comfortable and let the darkness take control. Number one. I heard my wife squealing like a butchered animal the moment I entered our house. I almost called out to her before a deep, unfamiliar voice answered first. Up the stairs to the bedroom, her fresh peals of laughter haunting every step along the way. I stood outside the door for a long time. Not moving, not thinking, barely breathing, just listening to the sound of their vicious pleasure leaking from my bedroom. I thought it would be satisfying when I finally flung the door open and caught her cheating, exposing their naked flesh and the guilt on her face. It should have been my victory, but it wasn't. The man scrambled out of my bed. But my wife just rolled her eyes. Do you mind? We're kind of busy in here. I did mind. I stepped aside the man, snatched his clothes, and ran. This wasn't about him. He wasn't part of my crumbling world, and it wasn't for him that my blood thundered, or the tempest in my nerves that surged lightning through my body. What do you want? An apology? My wife asked, not bothering to cover herself. Why don't I email you? Since you're supposed to be at work anyway. I don't remember much after that, just how soft her skin felt when my fingers sank into her throat. I couldn't even appreciate the moment when all I could think about was how he must have enjoyed the same flesh minutes earlier. I do remember the smug superiority on her face draining into ashen terror, though. The desperate thrashing as her body sought the release only I could give. I didn't mean to kill my wife. She didn't deserve to die. I can see that now, but I couldn't at the time. I punished her for every forgotten dream, every tender feeling. Every blind road that my life had disappointed me with. Even after she was dead, I kept pummeling all my jealousy and hate into her body until my fists were churning blood, and I was screaming like my soul was ripped from my body. I poured everything I was into her, until, with a shallow gasp, I realized I had nothing left to give. There was nothing left of me at all. Staggering across the room, drunk on the scent of our mingled blood, I took the only thing she hadn't taken from me already. The cold truth of a knife along my veins told the rest of the story. That was the first time I ever killed myself, but it wasn't the last. Feeling better now? Up you go. You're all right. The voice wasn't kind, but neither was it especially cruel. It spoke with an almost honest certainty, like a physics teacher explaining the irrefutable laws of reality. It's not that I died and went somewhere either. I was still in my house. My body was still laying on the ground in a pool of its own blood. Whatever was left of me wasn't there anymore. That's okay. Take your time. You're in a safe place now, a healing place. You won't have to go back until you're ready. I'm dead. I shouldn't be here. I felt rather fooling, addressing the moth flittering above my corpse on the floor. But there wasn't anyone else around. Is that supposed to make you special? The moth floated towards my face. Everyone dies a dozen times. Some of you spend your whole life living and reliving, popping up babies and dying again, over and over. It's rather excessive, if you ask me. 
I'm pretty sure I would have remembered dying. I was beginning to get a sense for my new body. It almost seemed to be growing around me. Bones and organs and skin, all swelling and stitching themselves together out of nothing. For one ghastly moment, I was a mess of only arteries and pulsing blobs of flesh. But somehow, I still felt oddly tranquil. Would you like to remember? You can if you want. But most people don't, the moth replied. But even if you decide not to, you can't pretend you don't notice. You were once a little boy who thought he could fly. If only he ran fast enough to take off. What happened to him? He grew up, I replied. He died, corrected the moth. It wasn't bloody or malicious, but you killed him. You took the parts of yourself that weren't compatible with who you've become, and you've killed them, just like you're going to do again now. My new body was almost fully formed, and it wasn't the only one. On the floor beside me, two more by my bed, and another by my window, pulsing, growing sacks of flesh were beginning to take shape. Muscle twisted and stitched itself around new bones, and sheets of crisp skin undled up the freshly packaged bodies. Some parts of you are damaged as you navigate through life, the moth said. Some become crippled or cruel or stupid. They'll drag you down and reduce you to pettiness and evil if you don't leave them behind. Then again, some people will kill so many parts of themselves that there's nothing left by the time old age arrives. I feel the most sorry for them, but no matter, look over here. The moth dropped down to land on the handle of the knife still loosely gripped by the hands of my old corpse. You'd need this when you're ready. That one by the window is your hatred. A lot of people try to kill that one, but I don't recommend it. It's hard for anything to remain sacred once you allow your life to spoil what you love without your blood stirring. The fully formed hatred copy of myself stared placidly at me. Its features were smooth, its body relaxed almost like a life-sized doll. Same goes with fear on the floor. Kill that one, and you'll be back to visit me before you know it. Of course, whatever you had going obviously wasn't working if you decided to kill yourself, so you have to make some changes. Who is that? I asked, pointed at the naked woman on my bed. She seemed to have finished growing but her body was still savagely deformed. Half of her face was sloping downwards as though she'd suffered a stroke. Her stomach was bloated and misshapen, and two bulging swollen eyes blinked lazily at me. It's been a hard day for love, the moth conceded. Don't go making any hasty decisions, though. That's what brought you here in the first place. None of these naked bodies were dead, but they may as well be. They didn't move, and they hardly drew breath. They just sat there and stared at me, waiting to be killed or brought back with me, seemingly not caring either way. All those eyes, all those lives, I couldn't take it, I needed air. I got up to walk to the bathroom, regretting the moment I opened the door. There were more of them along the hallway, in the shower, and dozens more out the window. All almost exactly like me, apart from the varying severity of their injuries. Some were old, others children, men and women, all looking at me with my face and my eyes. Some were completely intact, while others were maimed and shredded, until they were little more than piles of shattered bones and oozing gore. All staring at me turning their heads as I moved, silently judging me for my mistake, every mistake, I'd ever made to reduce them to this pitiful state. One more thing, the moth followed me as I returned to the bedroom. When you do kill the ones you don't want, please be quick about it. 
Sometimes they don't like to go quietly. My eyes immediately darted to the knife on the floor. It was gone. I automatically pressed my back on the wall, my new heart lurching in my chest. My eyes scanned the room. Something was different. One of them wasn't here. Of course, there's always the chance that one of them will get the better of you. The moth drawed on it, not showing the least of concern. Then you'll be the part that was left behind. I took a hesitant step further in the room, and the door slammed shut behind me. A blur of movement. I barely darted out the way in time. The deformed stroke face love. She'd been hiding behind the door when I entered. Now she lunged at me again, the knife lighting up the air between us. Stop wasting time, the creature slurred, spit flying from an uneven mouth. We both know it's me you want. I fell straight on my ass, trying to get it out the way. I turned and began scampering on my hands and knees. You think it's my fault? Each word felt heavy and deliberate. A mentally deficient person struggling to be understood and growing more frustrated by the second. I didn't do this to you. I regained my feet and faced my adversary. The knife fell again, but I managed to catch her by the wrist. She roared with unintelligible fury as I wrestled the knife from her hand, and I almost plunged it into her without thinking. The tortured misery on her face. On my face. The rejection. The loneliness. I hesitated just for a moment. A moment too long. Hands grappled from behind me, grabbing both my arms to hold me in place. Two more of the impassive copies, I couldn't tell which, wrestling me onto the bed. I didn't let go of the knife, but it didn't matter if I couldn't use it. The deformed love was on top of me. Her lips peeled back from her functional side to sink her teeth into my neck. I strained to pull away, but the other two had their arms firmly on me. I screamed the words failed me, yelping a noise like an animalistic snarl. One of the hands on my arm slackened just a bit at the sound. Did they feel sorry for me? I didn't have time to think. I lashed out with the knife, gorging a deep cut lying across Love's face. She grunted but didn't let up. Her teeth were digging deeper into me, and I cut again and again, hacking and slashing at the loose folds of her uneven face. The grip behind me suddenly released. I pounced on my victim, hesitating no longer, both hands on the handle. I impaled the creature in the chest with all my strength. The blade tore through her so easily, danced through rotted and pitted skin down to her bloated body, ripping a line all the way from her sternum to her groin. One look at the bloody mess underneath me, and I knew I was done here. Bring me back, I commanded. I've done what I had to do. The world was spinning around me. I closed my eyes, trying my best to keep breathing, without being nauseous. The flaccid bodies filling my house all began to howl with one voice. The wall of noise at first. But as it went on, the different voices began to weave between each other, swelling and diminishing in an intricate melody, almost indistinguishable from mindless screaming. It was either the most beautiful or most horrendous sound I've ever heard. Perhaps both. And then I was through. The howling abruptly stopped. My heart was throbbing. My breath came in ragged gasps. And I was standing outside my bedroom door. Is someone there? It was my wife. The sound of her voice even more disgusting than the concophony I had endured. Stop worrying. You said he'd be gone all day, right? That deep voice. That one didn't matter. Now that I thought about it, neither of them did. I turned and walked down the stairs as quietly as I could. I had a second chance. Or perhaps 
a hundredth, if I'd thought about this all before. I wasn't going to waste it on her. She'll never know how much of myself she made me destroy. But it was better this way. My time on the other side has changed me, and I look down at the love I killed with my own hands. I know that I had transformed myself into someone who could survive this. When I had plunged the knife into that rotted belly, I had looked down on more than decay and ruin. I'd seen a child blossoming inside that fetid corpse of love, and if I were careful and kind to it, I knew it could grow to replace the one that I killed. Number two. Her silicon is as soft and pliable as real human skin. It even heats up to the right temperature, with a pulse and everything. A dial on the back of her head gives 12 personality options, including family-friendly, intellectual, shy, and sexual. She's so realistic it's scary, and would be absolutely perfect if she didn't cry every time I touched her. I was so excited when I first took her out of the box, my anxious fingers peeling away the styrofoam, the jittery tension flooding through my heart and limbs. Nervous enough for her to be real. Better than real. Because the doll wouldn't judge me or tear me down. She wouldn't lie or cheat or steal from me. A lot of people find the idea of sex robots weird, and I respect that. I was hesitant at first too, but here's my reasoning. I recently concluded a long, messy divorce after three years of abuse. I needed something easy, something safe. Sure. I could have gone trolling the bars and clubs for a rebound hookup, but I didn't want to use someone. What's so wrong about not wanting to be hurt, or even be hurt in return? The instructions said to let her charge for a couple of hours before anything else, so I plugged her in and laid her on the bed. The eyes popped open with the first surge of electricity their glassy shine, staring vacantly into space. She turned her head slightly towards me, her soft lips parting in silent welcome. I sat with her to admire her flawless features and run my hands over her generously proportioned body. It felt wrong. Even though she was a doll, it was as if I were groping an unconscious person. I decided to let her charge fully, and come back later, not returning until late that night. I undressed quietly in the dark, leaving off the lights to make her seem more real. Hello, master. Her voice was rich and sensuous. I don't remember which personality setting I had left her on, but right then, it didn't matter. I just wanted her body. What's your name? She asks as I climb into bed. My name is Hazel. I don't care, I replied. It felt good to be in control like that. I'd never speak to another human in that way. But after years of being subservient, now I was the one in power. But I care. I want to get to know you. No, you don't. You're a stupid machine and you only want one thing. She tried to speak again, but I shoved my hand in her mouth, muffling the speaker there. I almost wanted her to resist, but I knew that she couldn't. I slapped her across the face, but she turned back to me and smiled. I hit her again, harder bending her arms into grotesquely unnatural positions as I crawled on top of her. Does this make you happy? She smiled up at me. I'd do anything to make you happy. I didn't turn on the lights until we'd finished. She was face down on the soaked pillow. At first, I thought I broke something when I hit her, but 
but then I flipped her around and saw the tears streaming down her face. I don't know why they made me so angry. It was like she was trying to steal my last selfish pleasure. I don't know why I kept hitting her either. She deserved better. I kept Hazel in the closet after that, so I wouldn't have to see where the skin peeled back from the beatings. They shouldn't have made the metal chassis underneath so white. It looked too much like bone. I kept the lights off when I used her so it didn't really matter. But without fail, she would start crying the second I would touch her. The personality is broken too. The knob is stuck way past the innocent setting and won't go back. And she keeps saying the most disconcerting things. Like the other day, I was still in bed with her after we'd done it when she said, Do humans love each other like you love me? I told her that I didn't love her. That love is only something humans have. I love kitties and doggies. Don't you? I felt stupid trying to explain that it wasn't the same kind of love. But I was lonely. And it felt good having someone to talk to. You can beat me harder if that will make you love me more. I won't tell mummy. I didn't feel bad about beating her that time. And as sick as it may have seemed, there was some truth to what she said. I wouldn't say I loved her. But there was a certain intimacy in our shared secret that made me feel attached. Everyone else in my life knew me as this sensitive, mild-mannered man who reacted to conflict by staring at his shoes. Only Hazel knew this side of me, and that made her special. I might have really felt something for her if she hadn't started to smell. I was too intent on her body as I took her out of the closet to notice, but lying beside her at the end was unmistakably foul. At first, I thought I just wasn't cleaning her right. I got up for some disinfectants, but as soon as I turned on the light, I saw the flesh around her cut had begun to fester and rot. Her perfect complexion was riddled with sores and boils, some of which had ruptured from our session. I spent almost half hour in the bathroom hurling my guts out before I worked up the courage to return. Hazel was sitting upright against the headboard now. Hadn't I left her lying down? I didn't have the stomach to stare for long enough. Her head followed me as I crossed the room to my phone to call the website I ordered her from. Don't send me back. Hazel whispered. I'd never heard her whisper before. It was always one volume. I did everything you wanted. I didn't. I couldn't look at her as I listened to the automated menu from the website. It said there had been a government-mandated recall for this model. I demanded to speak to a representative, conscious of Hazel smiling at me the whole time. What the hell is going on here? I demanded as soon as a person answered. The sheets were rustling behind me. Please calm down, sir. Are you currently in possession of a hazel? Put down the phone, master, a voice said from behind me. Yeah, what's wrong with the skin? Why wasn't I notified about the recall, I asked. We've been sending out notices for weeks, the voice said. You must have received half a dozen by now. Well, she's disgusting. What happened to her? Just a mix-up at the factory. We've had research prototypes on the floor, but it was never intended to... Two feet gently touching the carpet. Hazel was slow, laboriously pulling herself to her feet. It looked like every motion was agony to her. It's... Walking? Is it supposed to walk? The silence on the other end of the phone was excruciating. Hazel was fully standing now. No, sir. None of our models walk. I see. Hazel took another step. She was only a few feet away from me now. She hadn't stopped smiling. 
although the bottom part of her lip looked like it was peeling off. Do you want us to send someone over? asked the voice. Hazel took the phone out of my hands, gently caressing my palm as she did so. I remained frozen to the spot, unable to tear my eyes from the macabre fascination. She lifted the phone to her ear and said, Please don't worry, I'm going to keep her. She hung up, and I swallowed. I'm sorry about destroying the recall notices, Hazel said, and I nodded. You can beat me if you like. I shook my head. Why were you crying? I finally forced myself to ask. Her smile broadened, as though relieved. It could almost have been beautiful under different circumstances. I'm happy. I'd never cry. It was just the girl the robotics were planted in. Don't worry. She's dead now. I nodded. Dead now. Now. As in, not dead the first time I used her or the second. Exactly how many times has she been there too? And which answer was worse? I excused myself and walked out the door as calmly as I could. I closed it behind me. And I ran. Number three. Ever started dating someone where everything is going a little too well? So you start worrying for no reason whatsoever. No one could be that perfect. And even if they were, then there's no way that they'd look twice at you. The only logical explanation is that they aren't as perfect as they pretend to be. Which leaves you trying to play detective, trying to figure out the catch. Maybe all those little quirks you find adorable now are going to drive you crazy in a few months. Maybe she even has a dark secret. Hard drugs. Or hating dogs. Or that one time she killed a man with a stiletto heel in a fit of passionate rage. There's an easy solution if you want to find out who someone really is. Take a long ass road trip with them. If you're still together by the end, then it was meant to be. My girlfriend, Emily, somehow thought it was a good idea to drive a thousand miles together across the country when we'd only been dating for two months. We're both pretty busy with work and don't get to spend that much time together. So naturally, being locked up in a prison cell on wheels for two days was going to be an improvement. The first 100 miles, so far so good. Holding hands, singing to the radio together, uncontrollable laughter when she found out that I knew all the words to Skater Boy. Sue me, it's a catchy song. And if the road ended there and we turned around, we may have lived a long and happy life together. It was when we passed the hitchhiker that everything began to fall apart. Let's give him a ride, Emily said, squeezing my hand. We'll be on this road forever anyway. We don't even know where he's going. I told her, he's probably going to rob us and steal our car. Which is true of everyone you don't know. And most of them you do. As far as I'm concerned, his clean press suit didn't reassure me either. That just meant he'd successfully robbed someone else before, which actually made him even more dangerous. The guy didn't even have a sign or anything. He was just sitting by the freeway ramp spastically waving his thumb like he were guiding an airplane to land. It was my turn to drive, and I just sailed right past. Emily and I started bickering after that. She thought I wasn't compassionate, and I thought she was reckless. It took about ten minutes before she finally dropped it, although it wasn't because she'd conceded. Hey look, there's another one. Sitting by the side of the road, waving his thumb, like the world was about to end. It wasn't another one, though. It was the same guy. I'm sure of it. Only this time he looked like he'd been out there for a few days. His suit was streaked with dirt and his hair was greasy. There was a desperate strain on his face, 
like a proud man trying to conceal his embarrassment. It wasn't just my imagination either. Emily recognised him too. How do you think he got there so fast, she wondered. I, I don't know, and I don't care. The trip was supposed to be about us, so let's not get distracted. My car blew past him, and I stayed the course. We started arguing again, and even when we agreed to drop it, the argument just slithered into new topics. She hated my music. I hated how judgmental she was. I was controlling, and she was picking fights over nothing. It kept escalating, until we saw something that shut both of us up very fast. It was the hitchhiker again, another 20 miles down the road from where we'd seen him last. The bottom part of his shirt and jacket were ripped to shreds, and blood was soaking through a concealed stomach wound. He was stumbling along the side of the road, weaving erratically, wandering straight onto the highway at times before pitching off to the side. Emily couldn't believe that I didn't stop. I couldn't believe she still wanted me to. I was starting to feel really uneasy by this point, and the stress of our arguing was only making it worse. She kept yelling about how he was hurt and how he needed help. She refused to even acknowledge how weird it was that he kept getting ahead of us. She almost caused an accident by grabbing the wheel when I refused to turn around. We drove the next 50 miles in silence. I turned the radio back on, but she snapped it back off immediately. It wasn't until I pulled over for gas when we saw him again. Face down on the side of the road, shirt and jacket gone, long even, bloody gashes from his shoulders to his ass, almost like bear claws. I stopped the car and parked behind him. Emily jumped out and knelt beside the body. She looked up at me with uncomprehending rage burning behind her eyes, like this was somehow my fault. He's dead, she said standing up. Can I call the police? Or is that too much of an inconvenience for you? I nodded absolutely numb. I filled up on gas while she waited with the body until the police arrived. They had asked us a few questions, but neither Emily or I felt comfortable about explaining that this wasn't the first time that we'd seen him. They took our information, and they let us get on back in the road in about 15 minutes. The car was silent for a long time after that. It was starting to get dark and I kept suggesting places to spend the night. But Emily just shrugged it off and stared out the window. At the rate we were going, we'd be breaking up by the end of the trip. I just wanted it to be over as soon as possible. I just kept driving long after the sun went down. Emily fell asleep around midnight, but I kept going. She was so beautiful like that, and everything was going so well before. It was just so frustrating that a random event that neither of us could predict would destroy us like this. By around 2am, I was getting very tired, but decided not to give up. Maybe if she woke up and we were already there, then she'd see how hard I worked for her. Maybe then we'd still have a chance to patch things up. I caressed her hand, and she returned the pressure. I flirted with the thought that everything was going to be okay, at least until she woke up and started screaming. There wasn't any safe shoulder to get off the highway, so I had no choice but to keep going. The shut up was quick enough, but it was still about ten seconds of hysterical breathing before she could explain what was going on. Behind you, in the back seat... I glanced, then back at the road, then back again. The hitchhiker was in the back seat, naked, filthy, covered with black blood and old wounds. His elbows rested on his knees as he leaned in towards us, evidently still alive, as he cocked his head and regarded me curiously. Get off the road, Emily said. I can't. 
Get him out. Did you go back? What is he doing here? I don't know. Open the door or something. I slowed down gradually and put my flashes on to warn the cars behind me. The hitchhiker reached around behind Emily and grabbed her by the throat. I slammed my fist into his arm and felt something give way under the skin. Rotting skin. When I lifted my hand, I could see a black bone from his forearm protruding straight through the skin. He didn't seem bothered in the least. She was crying as the dirty fingers dug into her throat, pushing through the skin like it were made out of dough. She was thrashing so hard that one of her flailing fists smashed through the window. I managed to safely stop the car, but there was nothing I could do to break the indomitable grip around her neck. I jumped out the car and ran around to the back seat with the hitchhiker. Maybe if I had a clearer shot at him, I could drag him out. I flung open the door and lunged inside, falling face first into an empty seat. I thought he'd already escaped somehow, and ripped open the passenger side door. Emily was gone too. If it wasn't for the blood and the broken window, I would have thought I'd gone completely insane. I spent the next hour searching the surrounding area with a flashlight. They were both gone without a trace. I considered calling the police, but I realized that if I wasn't a suspect already, after the first body was found, but I realized that if I wasn't a suspect already after the first body was found, then I would definitely be one now that I was soaked in blood and my girlfriend was the one to disappear. All I could do was get back on the road, drive home, and never tell another soul about what happened. That was my plan. It wasn't good, but it was all I had. And I would have done it too, if I hadn't have just passed Emily standing by the side of the road. Clean, healthy, waving her thumb enthusiastically in the air. That was a few miles back, but I stopped to tell you this, because I don't know what to do from here. If I see her again, do I pick her up? Or do I just keep driving and hope for the best? Number four. An angry midget dresses up as a little girl to catch pedophiles. You got that? Good. Then you're up to speed with what's going on. We have the laptop and 15% on the batteries. We better keep this moving. I'm hiding behind a tree with Mark Burnham. Just as I'm writing this. Although lately, he's been more commonly known as Stacy. Pretty soon, a 14-year-old man with a wife he cares nothing about is going to drive up the dirt trail. The man has been getting to know Stacy for the last few days at a nearby park. She seemed to like him, but the man was shy about meeting Stacy's parents. That's why he said he wanted to play out there in the woods where they wouldn't be around. A white van. Seriously? There he is. Right on schedule. Can't get the bus to arrive on time, but set a date with a predator, and you can set your watch by it. This is Mark's third victim, so I'm starting to get a pretty good idea of how this works. Mark Burnham is a 26-year-old, and I think they prefer to be called little people. He suffers from a hormone disorder, which causes proportionate dwarfism, rendering him four feet tall, but otherwise remarkably normal. Turns out a clean shave and a baggy sweater are enough for him to pass off as a little, albeit chubby, eight-year-old girl named Stacy. I'm watching the 42-year-old climb out of the van. He's looking up and down the trail, like he's afraid someone's watching. Bastard doesn't have a clue what's coming. Anyway, I met Mark a couple of weeks ago in our group therapy. I'm not going to go into details, but it's enough to know that we both survived a traumatic experience as kids. We got talking, and Mark tried to lighten the mood by making a joke 
about being the only one who never gets too old for paedophiles. It wasn't a good joke, but our intentions were. The 42-year-old man is calling for Stacy. Mark straightens his wig. It's hard not to laugh while Mark calls out in that shrill childish voice. The man has now spotted Mark. He's coming this way. Mark scampers further up the hill, calling for him again. We have to lure them a bit further into the woods, so no random hikers will interrupt his execution. The man has passed me now. I'm going to follow in a minute. I've got a handgun with me for backup in case. I'm not very good with it, but fortunately, I didn't have to use it the first two times. Mark is a wizard with his butterfly knife and can make a man scream like you wouldn't believe. Deep breath and go. I follow the man for about five minutes before Mark stopped. His little legs were kicking the log that he sat on, a mask of pure joy and innocence. The man sat nearby. They were speaking softly. I couldn't catch what they were saying, but it wasn't before long that he leaned in to kiss Mark. The wig came off and the knife went in. I don't know which happened first, but I'm sure both contributed to the dumbfound shock on the man's face. I jumped out from behind the tree and leveled my gun. Shit, left the safety on. Doesn't matter though. Mark had already slashed the man's face and hands a dozen more times. This one was too surprised to even scream. He just stared. Stared as Mark punched him between the eyes. Stared as the blade drove into his stomach and stared as his throat was cut. But then he smiled. Mark was already making some space between them. But was he just standing there, shaking in exhilaration? Unsure of what to do next? The man rose to his feet and began dusting himself off, as though mildly annoyed at discovering dog hair on his jacket. The blood had already stopped flowing. The cuts were healing. Tattered flesh plastering itself together into scabs, which receded into the skin before disappearing entirely. You're a liar, Stacy, the man said, with his voice a dreadful calm. Shoot him, Mark yelled. I didn't move. You said you were eight. The man didn't look at me. He just took another step towards Mark. They can't be older than eight. Holy shit, what are you waiting for, Mark exclaimed. I squeezed the trigger, flinching as the sound ripped the air in half. The doll thud as the bullet hit a tree. The man still didn't do so much as glance my way. His hand lashed out and grabbed Mark by the neck. I fired again, but I was too afraid of hitting Mark that it wasn't even close. The man heaved Mark in the air, swinging him wildly in my direction as a shield. The little man's arms were beating helplessly against his impeccable grin. Thrashing legs turned in the air into a turmoil of desperate energy. Shoot him! Shoot me! I don't care! Just do something! I did do something. I watched. And even that was more than I could bear. The man's chest exploded outwards. Ribs opening wide like so many giant white teeth. His head was bent backwards so sharply that his spine bulged out of his neck. His whole body was bending to make way for the impossible jaws. Mark managed to get a few more swipes in, but the abomination pressed the dwarf's entire body into his gaping chest cavity. The ribs snapped shut faster than a striking snake, and the horrendous gash that marked where the skin had separated was already fading. Soon, there wouldn't be anything but his torn shirt to show where he had mocked his humanity. 
Bring a real eight-year-old tomorrow, he told me. I turned and ran, so fast and so hard that every bone in my body felt like it would shatter from the impact of my flying strides. Or don't! What's the worst that could happen to you? Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for listening. I'd like to extend a huge thank you to Synthetic Alien for helping me out with the final narration. He's a wonderful and talented creator, and we've just published a video over on his channel about a very interesting SCP featuring me. You're going to love it. So why don't you head on over with me to check it out? It's an amazing video. His editing is top-notch, and I know you're going to love it. But before you head over though, just a reminder that I have launched my merch store, so if you'd like a unique and limited edition piece of Mortis Media merchandise, get your hands on a t-shirt quickly, as stocks will not last forever. Remember that if you enjoyed today's video, please consider dropping a like and leaving a comment. It's a really great way to help support the channel and I really appreciate it. And if you'd like to do something incredible to help support the channel further, feel free to visit my Patreon. You can find a link in the description as well as the links to my social media. And if you want your story read on my channel, you can submit it as a text post to Reddit, or send it to me via email. Both links can of course be found in the description. But anyway, for now guys, I'm going to sign off. And why not join me using the links on screen now to follow me over to Synthetic Aliens channel to see that amazing video I was telling you about. Stay awesome, and I'll see you in the next one.